Five minutes on the clock, sir. Time starts now. Hello, uh, my name is Eric Hanley. I am one of the founding members of Pumping Station One, uh, Chicago's great hacker space. Um, I hope most of you guys just saw Mitch Altman's talk about communities. Uh, we are one of those hacker space communities where we, uh, we have a workshop, we do classes, uh, public, private, um, anything, focus groups, uh, movie nights, pirate parties, file sharing, um, any sorts of stuff that you guys are into. Um, let's see. Everything questionable. Everything questionable. <laughs> uh, we do some beer brewing, we do some, uh, we, I think there's a war zone in the works with some of the other hackerspaces through a VPN. Um, I don't know who's heading that project right now. Um, but I encourage all of, you, all of you to stop by. We are located uh, Belmont and Elston-ish. So near the Blue Line Belmont stop. Um, there's cards. There's many cards. We have pins as well, um, directions. We have a website. Um, some of the stuff we're doing right now, uh, you guys saw the uh, MakerBot in the hallway. Um, this is my own little hack here, the uh, one laptop upper child, which I put in a uh, aftermarket keyboard in. Um, some other stuff we're working on right now, uh, biosensor array. Uh, Drew here works on it, Avner. Um, we're, we're making a kit, heart rate, EEG, uh, galvanic skin response, basically just an open source uh, medical logging kit. For. We're targeting school students right now, but eventually marathon runners and cyclists as well. So, yeah, it's going to be really cool. Um, that's also associated with the global, the great global hackerspace challenge sponsored by uh, Mitch and Element 14. So we got a little money for R&D for that. And, uh, yeah, we're having a lot of fun. Um, hope you guys come out sometime. Any questions? Does Pumping Station 1 have two different... Uh, workshops going on this very week? That we do. In <laughs> fact, Thursday, Mitch Altman here is, uh, uh, what, what, what's the workshop on? Soldering? Uh, soldering and making cool things with microcomponents. There you have it. Anyone can do it. Straight from the source. Uh, what's the second one? Uh, very similar. There's another electronics workshop on Saturday. It's all about blinkies and LEDs. Blinkies and LEDs. Sweet, sweet. Where and what time? Uh, check the website or ask them. Um, any other questions? How am I doing? Two minutes. Oh man, I have a lot of time left. So I guess we'll start at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> yeah, is there a website? There is a website. Website is pumpingstation1.org. Uh, we also have a Twitter account. Yes, all the way spelled out, lowercase, no underscores. Um, yes. Yes. Dues. Um, we have two pricing structures. One is the starving hacker rate, which starts at $40 a month. You get a key, um, access to our, all our classes uh, with no fees. Um, then our full membership, you get the key as well. You get a locker so you can store projects at the space and they won't be cannibalized. Um, and voting rights. So you can be more an active part of the community. Question. The websites, is the one spelled one or O-N-E? O-N-E. O-N-E, yep. We have a table in the exhibitors area with yeah. swag to the take home. It's got the URL written on it. Yes, yes. and there's plenty of uh, cards here and uh, pins as well. Um, some of our, the tools we use, we've got a full wood shop. We've got a bunch of table saws couple radial saws, um, gosh, we've got a welder, we've got a, a small hobby metal lathe, um, we've got the maker bot, uh, we've got a whole electronics bench, solder, soldering irons, um, scope, server rack that a server rack, can use. yep, yep, shopsmith, shopsmith right, um, we used to have a DJ booth, I know we have some equipment for that, not all, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, Really fun place to go. Um, and honestly, the workshop area, it's something to brag about, but that's not why I go. I go for the community, just being around people who are doing cool stuff, because it's awesome. I mean, you get inspired, and you get, there's people there who are just like, well, do magnets really affect flash drives? And somebody knows offhand. No, they don't. It's not how the physics work. So I mean, it's just really cool <laughs> to be hanging around with that kind of crowd. You don't even have to Wikipedia stuff, so. Five, four. 
Thank you very much. It's on the clock. Time starts now. All right. Hello. This is how to be big, dumb, and loud, or how to be awesome with slides by learning from my mistakes. All right. I am Justin Love. Uh, you can contact me later if you have any questions. I'll also have this thing again at the end if you don't have time to write it down now. All right. Also, also have links to anything I refer to. I actually had to pull some stuff out, so you can go to my website later and, and get that. But anyway, yeah, go, go to the resources there. I'll get these slides up later on. So actually, that's the first tip. In, include links. Anyway, so there are some benefits to getting up and actually giving a talk and, and sharing your ideas. For one thing, it's just plain self-promotion. You know, don't have a big ego about it. You can, you can get your name out there, maybe get some attention for your projects. Uh, which means, have this slide, you know, just mention it, say who you are. All right, but it's really about communication. I mean, one of the things people were talking about this conference is, okay, we've got all these people doing piping and plumbing, and, and, and they want to, you know, sit in the corner and do something cool. But you have to communicate your ideas. If you want to sell open source, you have to get out there and talk about it and make it sound exciting and sexy and cool. And you know, make it look good, not like you know, the, 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 the PowerPoint deck that people are using to do sell enterprise software. All right. So this can also come in handy if you're looking for a job. You get your name out there. Show people you can communicate. That's one of the things people talk about you know, for skills for people. Uh, you can also learn things. It, Having to put things in a clear format helps you understand it better. I didn't think about putting how to make slides into big, dumb, and loud until I made this presentation. It, it, it clarifies your thoughts on these things. So first of all, you have to be big. The thing is, you know, well, I like this slide because it's both a support and somewhat of a counterexample at the same time. Uh, but you, you want to make things as big as you reasonably can. You know, focus on one thing at a time so you, so you can make it big and readable. Even though we've got these big screens, uh, not everybody is right in front of them. Sometimes you get really big halls and they're farther away. And not everybody has perfect eyesight either. Uh, on that note, avoid putting your content in a frame. It shrinks things down and it distracts your content a little bit. And most of the time it's just pure decoration. A <clears throat> thing you want to do is make it very simple and dumb. And what I'm talking about here is avoid slide humans. I saw a lot of things like this at the conference. And you're throwing a lot of stuff up at once. It's, it's forcing the text to be smaller and harder to read and you know, people may be reading ahead. Um, I like to avoid bullet points. I use them only when I'm actually doing a list of something like my contents or a collection of things I want to identify as a collection, so to speak. If you do it, have a progressive reveal so people are not reading ahead and not paying attention to what you are saying. Um, I, similar to frames, I don't like putting logos on every single slide. It, it's a distraction. You know, if you're promoting something, you know, have a slide about that. Say who you are, what you're doing, maybe beginning, maybe end. By the way, when you see to go is uh, next week if you're interested in mobile tech, tech stuff. Also, you want to make it loud. And, and what I'm talking about here is the fact that projectors suck. And, then, and, and it just, you always have these troubles, oh, sorry, you can't see that. You want to have as high contrast as possible. Black and white are your best bet. You can have a little bit of color, but um, don't put color on black. I see lots of people doing source code. They've got their dark color scheme in their editor, and you, you cannot read it. Sometimes people go looking for the, you know, what's that five character key, combina or key combination to make it invert the screen so you can actually read it. Um, so by, by and large, black and white, uh, you can get away with some color if you're careful. I have, I have some tools in my longer version about how to make that work. Also, your images will suck. Now, because we're on a projector, I can't really demonstrate that to you, but here is an advanced simulation. This is your image. This is your image on the projector. By and large, you will not be able to see anything if you take a normal looking image and try to project it on the screen. All right, a couple of resources. I have, I have some more of my full thing. Uh, this is the book I have. It's called Slideology. There are other books out there. I, can't, I haven't read them, so I can't comment, but it has lots of little tips you can use be going beyond the basics. Uh, there's also a, a, uh, like a screencast type thing that will show you a bunch of little tips. Uh, it is for a small fee, but hey, everybody's got to make money, right? Uh, so in review, <clears throat> I want to make it big. I want to make it dumb. I want to make it loud. There are lots of little tricks you can use, but these three things will help, you know, you know, just get you past the worst sort of presentation faux pas. So there's all that information again if you want to write it down and contact me later if you've got any questions. Thank you very much.
Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Jim Campbell, and I work, uh, well, actually, I contribute to the GNOME and Ubuntu documentation teams. Uh, I just saw the presenter before us, so unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to, like, dumb up my presentation or enlarge the size of my fonts. Um, but what I'm here to talk about briefly is kind of what's going on with GNOME help. Uh, GNOME is coming out with uh, version 3 in just a little bit. So I'd like to first, I guess, just identify some of the problems with some of the user help that we've had in the past. Uh, what we've had in the past has primarily been done with DocBook. How many of us are familiar with DocBook? DocBook XML. A couple people, a couple of hands being raised. A couple of people with beards raising their hands and things like that. So, all right. So um, DocBook is what had been used primarily within GNOME documentation in the past. And we wound up with manuals like this. Uh, this is actually the full manual for the uh, uh, Palimpsest Disk Utility. And what it does here is we present a screenshot. And then the next screen says, uh, Palimpsest Disk Utility is a complex program with many advanced features. Mm -hmm. Doesn't really provide you with any user help, right? Uh, and if we didn't have that, then we'd end up with something like this, where it was just a very linear manual style um, that focuses on, uh, you know, there's an introduction section, a getting started section, which uh, again, uh, really identify some issues with the user interface and things like that. So what we can see here is that it's not actually uh, show, helping the user solve their problems. Um, and a, a doc book is also a very linear format. It's, it was primarily written to write books um, and manuals and things like that. So it's not actually topic focused to address user questions. Um, it also has a lot of extraneous uh, syntax that is not really relevant to user help. For example, this is a legitimate doc book tag. Word as word. A word meant specifically as a word and not representing anything else. So that is a real doc book tag. So what we have instead of this is a, is a project called Mallard. It's being developed uh, by the GNOME documentation team. Actually, primarily one person was on the team, Sean McCants, and then contributors uh, here and there, a couple of other, couple of other things. Um, a couple of other people. Uh, so what I'd just like to do here really quick is demonstrate a little bit of uh, the user help that will be featured in uh, GNOME 3. So this is the working version that we have for right now. Um, so you can see here that what we have, um, you know, we have some introduction topics and things like that to kind of, kind of get you started. Uh, but from there, whoops, so you can see some nice JavaScript uh, transitions on images. So some basic kind of screenshotty type stuff. But where we get into the good parts are when we get into seeing how, um, and again, this is kind of, kind of new, so it isn't fully fleshed out. We can see that we're addressing particular user questions. Um, what we're establishing here is a framework that can be very extensible for use later on. How am I doing on time? One minute, 40 seconds. Okay. All right. So it's very extensible. I'll show you that here. Okay, so that's not it. All right, so this here is not what I wanted to show you. <laughs> but this is, okay, so this is the index page for gedit help. Uh, and you can see here that it just features, uh, you know, four different sections there primarily. And they all get plugged in. Come on, terminal, don't fail me now. All right, so this is the gedit help that I wrote. I wrote this stuff. Um, so you can see that I had those four index sections, and then I plug in the user help really easily, just like that. So why is this good for GNOME? Because uh, it lets other distributions extend on GNOME and include their own help as appropriate. So let's look at that really quick. All right. So I have here some basic help about, uh, let's see. Let's look at help on iPods here, okay? So I've got some basic user help on iPods. Let's say I want to extend that, right? I'm going to include another help topic really quick. I'm going to close this. I'm going to navigate. 20 seconds. Okay. I can do this. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's say there's not any Dave, uh, Dave Matthews band user help in this system. We need to get some in there. All right. So what I do is I just take that. Plop it in the directory. 
And then I uh, re-render the help. And time. I'm not done. <laughs> All right, so now I have my Dave Matthews Band Sounds Bad on my iPod. Say, uh, your iPod is functioning normally. What can I do? The situation is easy to resolve itself. So, so yeah. Hey, Carl, turn his mic on. So it's, it's easily extensible. <laughs> Time starts now. Hello, I'm Jeremy Kahn. I'm a web developer. I'm here with myself. Um, and I'd like to, like to tell you about a project I'm working on. It's called Cappy. Cappy is a JavaScript framework. Uh, it's, it's for making keyframe animations on the, on the HTML5 canvas. Uh, it's a full API. Uh, first, who here knows what keyframing is? OK, so a few people. Uh, for those who don't, you're going to learn something, something new. Uh, so a little bit of history on, on the problem that Cappy solves. Uh, in the past on the web, multimedia needs were, 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 were met with Adobe Flash. It provided an easy way to make or deliver, make or deliver video, audio, and animations. Uh, this is the rich media content that everybody's looking for. Uh, examples, of the, ex examples of this are Homestar Runner, Newgrounds, and AlbinoBlackSheep.com. We all know these sites. We've probably wasted a lot of time on them. Uh, but that was the past, so what about the future? The future is HTML5. We're going to have an open web. HTML5 enables developers to provide rich content that, you, that users, have, users have come to expect. It's open and free. Uh, and it provides us with the video and audio elements for making video and audio. But what about animations? Uh, the problem is that the HTML5 canvas element provides developers all the tools to make static compositions, but not animations. This is the hard part, and this is the part that we, the, the developers, have to figure out. We choose a library, or we, we, ro we, we roll our own. So in review, we've got Flash with video, audio, and animation, and HTML5 with video and audio. So the solution is Cappy. Cappy is an open source JavaScript framework that provides an easy way to make animations. It provi provides four key uh, layers of functionality. That's state timing, layering, timeline control, and a helpful structure to tie it all together so you don't have a big jumbled mess. Uh, Cappy is named after exactly what it is. Uh, it's the keyframe API. Uh, and for those who don't know what keyframing is, it's an animation technique for defining states at specific points in time. So let's say you've got a circle, and you want your circle to be the bottom left of the screen in one second, and the top right of the screen in five seconds. Uh, and you just want to have the rest of it just figured out for you. <clears throat> that's keyframing. And this is actually the animation model that's used by Adobe Flash. Uh, a lot of people are very comfortable with it, and it's very successful because it's easy. Uh, a few of Cappy's important features are it's extremely accurate. This is actually what a lot of frameworks get wrong. There's animation frameworks out there, but a lot of them don't actually calculate where things should be based on real time. It just kind of increments state based on uh, how, many, how many frames have already been rendered. Cappy actually figures things out in real time. Pausing system resources are not a problem. Uh, it's got a really straightforward and easy to learn API. It actually looks a little bit like jQuery, so if you're used to that, then you're going to feel right at home with Cappy. Uh, and if you spend some time in the docs, which do exist, um, then it can probably be learned in about a day. Uh, also, that just because it looks like jQuery, it has nothing to do with jQuery. It actually has no dependencies at all, so you just drop it in your page and you're ready to go. Uh, also, I've spent a lot of time optimizing it, uh, so it's very, very fast. There's extremely little overhead uh, and, uh, for each frame calculation. Uh, and of course, open source conference, open source framework. It's free and open source. It's under the MIT license or the please just use it license. Uh, and as I said, there's plenty of documentations and examples. Uh, to, so a review, we've got Flash, which gives us video audio, and, video, audio, and animation for about $700. And we have HTML5, which can do video, audio, and now animation with Cappy, and it's free. Uh, here's the information. Uh, it's, it lives on GitHub. Uh, you can just Google for Cappy GitHub. Uh, that's me, I'm Jeremy Kahn, my Twitter, and if, is there time to show a 15 second example? Yes, there is. Okay. And this is actually a little demo that I'm still polishing up, but you can see how it works. Oops. There we go. So, showing up? Yep. The hardest part of this is actually the trigonometry to make, all the, make the lines rotate because I'm really rusty at trigonometry, but the actual tweening was really, really straightforward. And that's Cappy. Thank you. I really don't need the display. I can talk. Go for it. Okay. Um, I was going to show you some nice slides of a presentation I made last year to the IEEE. Uh, one of the things is because I work with 
uh, engineers all over the Chicago Rockford area uh, that uh, these are people that do a lot of sophisticated things from circuit design, power system design, uh, uh, you know, mobile antenna design, yada, 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 you name it. But most of them are strictly Windows users. They don't really know much about Linux. A bunch of them have at least some involvement with embedded systems. And so uh, I gave this talk uh, last year about using Linux with embedded systems and uh, the various issues involved with the licensing, uh, availability, what kinds of systems. And uh, with my laptop and a little embedded ARM uh, PC-104 board uh, with some I.O. and some relays, uh, we actually got uh, part, a good part of the talk was uh, showing how easy it was, first of all, to set up a, uh, a, a compile tool chain on a, uh, on a, a, a Linux laptop or a workstation or whatever that could communicate with an embedded system board that you're developing for. Uh, we actually made some kernel configuration changes to the Debian Edge kernel that the board was using, modified that, made the, uh, compiled a new kernel during the talk. This was an hour, hour and a half talk, but we were able to actually, within, you know, 10 minutes, do a complete new kernel, install it on the board and run it, and set off a bunch of flashy, blinky lights on uh, a little breadboard. Uh, so the point is, is that Conferences like this are really important, but we also need to get other people to come to these conferences who may well benefit from open source, free open source software uh, for the kinds of projects that they are doing. And that's one of the things that I hope to do more over time is not only promote uh, uh, electrical engineering and engineering consultants in the Chicago area, but also to advance the cause of free and open source software in the engineering arena. Uh, and uh, it was a very successful talk, I think. I got a lot of good comments on it. I got written up in uh, the uh, local IEEE Chicago uh, 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 newsletter. <laughs> they were there, took some pictures. Uh, but that's my point, uh, that uh, we need to keep this community expanding into the general community. That's one of the reasons why I appreciated Kathy Malmrose's talk, is that we, you know, we can't keep it enclosed. We need to open open the open source arena to people who are not aware of it yet. Sounds good. And that and my wonderful slides. <laughs> Can I just use yours? Go for it. I prefer to be wireless on my camera. Okay. My name's Ann Peterson. Among other hats I wear, uh, I am the president of Pumping Station One. I am not here to talk about that. <laughs> I am also the face behind the website of UIC. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm actually here to talk about lightning talks. Lightning talks are a great way to get out new ideas, as we heard from Big, Dumb, and Loud. So you should try it. I would encourage you to try it. And I, in fact, have a venue for you to try it, if you'd like. We run an event at Pumping Station 1 called 300 Seconds of Fame, which is very generously cribbed from Noise Bridge's Five Minutes of Fame. So. It's, um, it's a takeoff. It was a combination of two of our events, and we do it every second Tuesday after our regular meeting, which happens at 8 o'clock. So if you want to, stop by. We have basically hold open mics. It can be a presentation. It can be a musical number. We're a lot more expansive than just lightning talks in particular. So it could be a demonstration, a debate, a run-through of proof of concept, performance art, circuit bending, whatever you like. A lot of them are a lot more interactive than like the lightning talks you see here. So we enjoy it a lot. It's basically, will it fit into five minutes? Is it feasible for, this, for the space itself? No live, you know, flame throwing, that kind of thing. Uh, and be appreciated by an audience? If so, you're completely welcome to come by and demonstrate whatever you'd like. Um, you can sign up with me, I run it. So if you have any interest in having another kind of audience at some later date, for something that you might be working on, stop on by. And here I would dramatically drop the mic, but I work here and I don't want to injure it.
Thank you, Anne. And I'm going to turn it now over to Stephen here. He's going to have some closing remarks. Oh, you can, you can fill this ice Oh, okay. Um, la, 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 la. Anybody know any good jokes? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs>